Jim is the new-ish. New-ish, uh, yeah, and not new yeah, anymore. <laughs> the director for the agency's Mars Exploration Program at NASA headquarters uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, Jim most recently served, before then, as the technical director and deputy program executive for, to have this right, Jim, command control, communication, computer intelligence, surveillance, and recon at the missile, at MD, the Missile Defense Agency in Huntsville. Um, among his other duties, he um, oversaw MDA's space development and test activities. More or less correct? Okay, That's Jim, great. the floor is yours. Thank you. So welcome to the session on human exploration and science at Mars. I just wanted to open and, and sort of frame the discussion here with a few comments. Uh, one is that humans have been exploring Mars now albeit heavily relying upon machines for almost 50 years, probably more than 50 years now. But machines don't do science, humans do. Science requires observation, questioning, hypothesis, and test. Machines gather data. Humans interpret data, and so it goes 24-7. Someone somewhere in the world is interpreting, contemplating, and planning Mars science remotely and distantly separated from the field, and doing so remarkably well. The robotic spacecraft, landers, and rovers that we've sent and are preparing to send have evolved into exceptionally capable laboratories. No longer are we just looking around, but rather we are performing incredibly complex sampling, assessment, and evaluation of the Martian environment. We're learning how Mars evolved, how it functions today, and what it's made of both at the macro level and at the molecular level. So how will science change when humans arrive in the field with their habitats and in their spacesuits and with the tools that they can bring along? Will science progress differently? If so, how? Or will machines just be different? Will there be a change of substance or efficiency or both? And where can we expect to see the most change? Today, we'll get a chance to hear from four people who have been working on the frontiers of planning for this change, each with a unique perspective on the conversation. We'll start by having them share their thoughts with us, and then we'll try some questions. Uh, first, for me as, an, as a moderator, get things going, and then following lunch, from you, the audience. So don't be bashful. No wallflowers today. Uh, let's have a little bit of fun with this and hear the thoughts of all these folks as they've been contemplating for years now, in many cases, with uh, very, very interesting backgrounds, just exactly how humans would exploit and advance scientific exploration at Mars. So we'll start. Uh, to my left here is Rick Davis. He's currently the Assistant Director for Space uh, Science and Exploration and the Science Mission Director at NASA headquarters. He's on detail from Johnson Space Flight Center, has substantial experience in human spaceflight operations, and he's came to headquarters to help integrate what we do in the Science Mission Directorate with the planning that's being done in the Human Exploration Mission Directorates. To his left is uh, Cassie Connolly. She's the NASA Planetary Protection Officer at NASA headquarters. She's responsible for ensuring that the United States complies with the Outer Space Treaty, which specifies that planetary exploration should be carried out in a manner so as to avoid contamination of the bodies that we are exploring throughout the solar system and also to avoid any adverse effects to Earth if materials are brought back from outer space. To her left is James Head. He's a distinguished professor of geological sciences at Brown University. He came to Brown in 1973 following his work with NASA on the Apollo program in which he analyzed potential landing sites, studied return lunar samples and data, and provided training for the Apollo astronauts. So of all of us on the stage, Jim has first-hand experience with exploring another body and preparing the crews to do so. His current research centers on the study of the processes that form and modify the surfaces, crusts, and lithospheres of planets, how these processes vary with time, and how such processes interact to produce the historical record preserved on the planets, which is the evidence that we would explore. To his left is Jacob Bleacher from Goddard Space Flight Center. His research focuses on comparing the development of volcanic provinces on the Earth, the Moon, Mars, and asteroids, and understanding their subsequent modification through a combination of terrestrial field studies and spacecraft data analysis. His current research combines fieldwork, geomorphology, volcanology, 
planetary geology, and remote sensing. So with that, I'll turn to you, Rick, if you have a few thoughts to share with us. Okay, so what we thought we'd do is give you, um, we have kicked off a number of efforts to actually uh, get the uh, science communities that are actually working with Mars every day um, in working with this human space flight communities so that we can really cross-share information and really try to make this happen in a much more timely manner and, and really leverage off of what we've all learned. So what I'm gonna do is give you a quick introduction to one of the big efforts that we kicked off last year, which is the, to start the process of picking a human landing site on Mars. And so um, we talked a little bit about it yesterday, if I can figure out how to, uh, there. Um, so obviously, we've all talked about this for the last couple of days. The goal is to get uh, uh, humans there to the surface and actually in a sustained presence. Um, and so I love this picture actually taken straight from the movie The Martian because it actually makes it feel very real, which is key. Uh, the goals of the study are really a couple fold. First of all, um, we are trying to uh, say a major change that's come along is this recognition that we're not doing it like we did it in the Apollo program. We want a semi-permanent base that we can then build up. Um, and as I, if you were here yesterday, I alluded to that it actually is very consistent with the way almost all exploration has been done, where you have a node that you can build up logistics. The urgency for doing this is a mini-fold. Um, we have some amazing assets at Mars right now, and we want to take full advantage of them to help us start this process and figure out what we need to know to actually pick a, uh, the landing site and the exploration zone. I'll use those terms interchangeably. Uh, and we want to build up a set of those. I actually, we have, uh, um, and then, uh, then really start culling them down as we get data. And then finally, we're using this process to also inform what we need to have in terms of future reconnaissance at Mars. It's becoming pretty clear, pretty fast, that we do not have sufficient information to actually pick the landing site and that we're going to need additional reconnaissance. That actually works well because of the current orbit, the main orbit, the Mars Reconnaissance Observatory is getting is past, well, it's at 10 years of age. You can do the math. It's, it needs to be replaced just for its existing purposes. Um, this, to introduce you to the exploration zone layout, um, it's really kind of a cool idea where you're actually using science and human exploration needs together. It's like the idea of a semi-permanent base again. But what you'll see in these different colors is indicating that we're looking for diversity of science in this thing. Science is a, a major activity of what humans will be doing. And so we uh, listed a whole set of criteria of different types of science that we think would leverage the most of having a human being in that process. Additionally, living off the land is crucial. It doesn't mean you're doing ISRU uh, or institute resource utilization right from the beginning, but it does mean that you have to have the feedstocks there when you pick the semi-landing site, and so that's the urgency of, of doing this. Uh, we've talked about McMurdo. Um, I, the, McMurdo's kind of fascinating because it actually started out as basically a hut, and it has evolved, and that's what the lines are going across saying, to a point now where it's actually got urban planners involved because it's getting such a, a, a significant presence. And, that is actually just a really nice example of where a site, a node was picked and just grew up. And so all these parts and spares and logistics can all be deposited there. And then the explorers can go out from there and actually do real science. Uh, next thing, um, there are lots of analogies. Jamestown, you've got Quebec City, you've got the International Space Station is actually an example of this paradigm where you, actually, you create a node and then you build up from it. Jamestown was kind of cool. I took my kids there. You know, it basically was a flop. You know, uh, it wasn't chosen well. And one of the things we're trying to do is get all the right communities, and that includes you all, to actually help us figure out where the right spot is on the planet Mars. To, so it's not a flop, and it actually can we can build on it. Pioneering the ISRU, I'm not going to belabor this one, but the bottom line is it costs so much in terms of propellant to go from low Earth orbit to get, deliver everything, whether it be a piece of equipment for, or a la, out of a lab or just delivering propellant, something similar to that, is that it costs so much to take it all the way there that using the stuff you can produce at Mars is crucial. And so this is kind of a comical version of it, but it actually gets at the point, which is that we have to seriously look at the resources that Mars makes available. And there are a lot of resources, maybe not packaged the way we would want them on this Earth, but they're there. Um, we had the landing site thing. We had 45 pr proposals. I will tell you, I was absolutely amazed at how good they were. These are people mostly out of, really, it was an aggregation of communities. It was the normal science community that would do Mars landing sites for robotic missions, ISRU guys, human spaceflight guys, and we really, they were sort of 
building into teams themselves that were integrated. And if um, I know a number of you all were there, um, I, uh, number, you guys were there, um, and so was Jim. And so the point being, there was a tremendous energy there where you start seeing all these ideas starting fusing together, and it, really that's how it'll happen, I, we're convinced. Um, and then the, another result is that this idea of advanced reconnaissance is really key, and because that, uh, and here's a map, this is a really cool map that um, actually the little white circles are the landing site proposals or exploration zones, and they literally cover the entire planet. Um, we went as far north as 50 degrees, north, far north and south as 50 degrees, because really we were trying to expand the envelope to include um, essentially subsurface ice as an, as an option. Um, and so you'll see this, the signatures were really a lot of fun too, I might have. Then the big thing that's rotating, the whole question appears to be rotating on now, is that the current assumptions for ISRU um, is that it's, it's oxygen out of the atmosphere, but what we're realizing now is that water has been discovered on Mars, and that water is a massive asset, and could will probably, I would say, from what we know right now, drive where we set up this base. And so I'm not gonna go through all the different feedstocks, but you know, in a nutshell, there, there's essentially uh, minerals that have water molecules locked up in them, and then there's a subsurface ice for either from old oceans or glaciers, and we know that they're there. Um, and so, but we, the curious thing is we don't know where the, we don't know the existence of them in the very near surface uh, part, which is the, really one of the biggest parts we have to do with reconnaissance. Um, uh, I do want to mention because um, Cassie's coming up next. Um, that, uh, that the use of water puts us on an intersection where we're gonna have a very dynamic conversation, we already are having it, between uh, the needs of what a human crew will need um, and to support a base versus what the, the goals of science and that sort of thing, so that's a debate that we have to have. And then following up here, um, we've actually already started imaging requests at Mars to um, uh, start filling out these different exploration zones, so we are moving out on this thing. Uh, the Evolvable Mars campaign, which is at the human spaceflight side, they have actually initiated at several studies now to look at using, factoring in water much more heavily into their overall architectures to help lower the overall cost and to thereby increase the doability of this mission. Um, and then uh, we've started work on an orbiter, a uh, potential orbiter in the uh, early 2020s, we hope, um, because that's that reconnaissance piece. And then we have kicked off a team to actually go off and start really looking at these feedstocks that are at Mars and trying to figure out how much mass, power, and operational complexity are we really talking about with each single one. The first report of that has already been done. We expect a follow-on report, but we're pushing this pretty hard because that informs our whole next steps and when we do a next uh, potential landing site. And I think that might be all I've got, Jim. Um, and these are a list of other things that we're doing, but really it's the, it's the thing, and then we're aiming to have another workshop to start drilling this thing down. I personally expect to see an increase in the number of exploration zones proposed on the next go around, but then we'll start ramping it down. And it's really key to do this because we ultimately want to start driving our robotic science missions to this location so that we can ground truth what we're seeing there, both from an ISRU thing, and really learn about that environment to make sure we understand how to operate there and operate safely there. Uh, with our crews when we get there. And I think uh, this is the team. It was a wonderful team. Anyway, so, this, so the, Rick, before we move on, Rick, just one thing just to, to clarify. You used the term feedstock numerous times, which, yes. which is maybe a little bit of inside baseball in terms of the kind of terminology we're used to in talking about our other missions. But what you're looking at is what are the raw resources that are available at different locations of Mars in order to inform the decisions on where you go and the kinds of technologies you might think about using to exploit that, for example, for ISAU. Right. On the premise that not all acreage on Mars are the same. So that is exactly, thank you for clarifying that, Jim. That is exactly what we're talking about. The big ones are obviously oxygen, then water now, we know it's there, we, we need to figure out how to go get it. But you know, Mars is a whole planet. Right. You know, and so we really want to be, um, as much as we can, pick a smart site that actually allows us to live off the land fully, even potentially to support 3D printing purposes and that kind of thing. And the good news is that unlike Jamestown, you know, we have birds that we can put in orbit around Mars and actually do real reconnaissance. 
We've got ro robotics uh, um, lander, robotic landers that we can put down and actually ground truth it. And we can actually do a really good job of picking this semi-permanent base. And the other thing I would add to that is, um, is that what we have found is that there is an amazing overlap between the human spaceflight needs and the science needs on this particular issue of these resources. Science wants to know what, what is in those, uh, uh, the, what I would call near surface water um, deposits, if you will, if we can call it that way. Um, and that's an incredibly valuable thing to know and learn in terms of understanding how Mars works. So there's like a 90, 95, I'm making up a number, but 90, 95% overlap of interest in terms of that regard. All right, thank you. Cassie? Thank you, and glad to be here. Thanks for everybody who's in the audience. I will mention that my ancestors got to this country at Jamestown, so I'm not entirely <laughs> sure they would agree with you. Yeah. Or maybe that was a different kind of thing. Well, there were 18, uh, I love the number, there were 20,000 people who came to, roughly speaking, between 1607 and 1623 to Jamestown. 18,000 of them weren't so lucky, so. Well, that just shows that certain Earth life can, right. can survive, right? Um, unfortunately, that's another example of uh, fire burden reduction. Um, so I feel a little bit like a policy sandwich in that I'm going to get back to some of the things that Bill Nye was talking about yesterday and give, pull back a little bit and give you some of the background as to what it, considerations that one would want to take into account when planning for any mission to Mars, but in particular human missions to Mars. And of course, one of the major science questions that we're interested in answering, as Bill Nye so very eloquently said it last night, as what's out there, are we alone, where did we come from, or slightly more scientifically phrased, what are the origins, distribution, and future of life in the universe? And this is a question, of course, that humans have been asking for thousands of years. This image is a picture that's painted on the wall of the building where I initially started working at NASA, at NASA Ames Research Center. But the point that's very important when we're asking this question this is the reason that planetary protection was founded in the 1950s before even the launch of Sputnik, is the recognition that it's absolutely trivial to find life anywhere. We just bring it with us. We want to find Mars life. We don't want to find Earth life that we carried along for the ride. So that becomes a much more difficult question because life is everywhere on Earth. And we can learn a lot about the process of exploring, the process of searching for life, the process of doing any other human activity, in fact, by looking at our past, Jamestown being only one example. Um, but humans have been moving around on Earth, have been exploring the Earth, have been transporting other organisms around on Earth also for millennia, since we were migratory primates out of Africa. Uh, there is actually a book that was written um, not too long ago by Charles Mann, 1493, this is the sequel to another book that he wrote that was 1491 that was describing the Americas, the new world from the perspective of the Europeans before they discovered it, before the Europeans discovered the Americas, before Columbus arrived. That was 1491. 1493 describes what happens after Columbus arrived, after humans started migrating around globally using ships and transporting the organisms that they're interested in carrying with them the other humans, microbes, both on purpose and not on purpose. And that book is really an excellent set of lessons learned for why we do planetary protection. That's absolutely, it, it was not the initial foundation. 1950s, people hadn't actually started the environmental movement. There wasn't a recognition of how much humanity has affected the ecology, the global ecology, by moving other organisms around. But since then, we've discovered that, and those lessons are very important for us to consider as we start going elsewhere, because launching rockets off the Earth and getting to another planet is a huge bottleneck. That's something we have the ability to control, and we, so far, under the auspices of planetary protection, as well as a number of other activities looking at space, uh, transportation, space flight, uh, even the commercial side, as you heard a little bit from George Neild yesterday, those Considerations need to be taken into account to ensure that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past and bring things like malaria to the new world. Malaria causes in Central America a $5 billion a year economic hit today. There was a sailor on one of Columbus's ships who had quartane fever. Malaria was endemic in Europe. That's the kind of thing we don't do if, we're to go, if we have the opportunity to avoid making those kinds of mistakes. It would be a good idea to do so. So that's 
fundamentally what planetary protection is based on, initially looking at protecting the ability to search for life on another planet, but because of the precautionary approach where we don't take steps when we don't understand the consequences, it also preserves the ability or pre protects the whatever other future activities people might want to do on other planets. And critically and absolutely essential for the discussion of this topic as well as to make sense in general, planetary protection is based on data, based on science, based on what we know and the recognition that we don't really know what we don't know yet. We need to find out. So, um, and again, mentioned yesterday by Bill and various other people, planetary protection is after, so planetary protection started in the 1950s. In 1967, when the Outer Space Treaty was signed, planetary protection was written into the treaty, Article 9. Avoid harmful contamination of other planetary objects. Avoid adverse changes to the environment of the Earth resulting from the introduction of extraterrestrial matter. So we protect other planets from things on Earth. We protect the Earth from things coming back. And we don't know what the consequences could be. It may be, as Bob Zubrin claimed last night, that there are no consequences. It's all happened already. But we don't know that. He may be confident. I'm not. The people who wrote the Outer Space Treaty were not. Carl Sagan was not. Uh, so there, there's a range of opinion. And if you're only going to affect one person, sure, go off and follow your own opinion. When it comes down to the possibility of a global effect, we need to have at least a reasonably strong global consensus about what needs to happen. The consensus that we do have is maintained by the International Council for Science, the Committee on Space Research, and that is that when we explore other places, we do it based on the science, particularly in the context of, of looking for life. So if you're going to an object that can't possibly host Earth life, well, don't need to worry about that. No problem. We don't have to do anything to our spacecraft to prevent the Earth life from getting there because it won't grow when it's there. Likewise, if you're bringing stuff back from somewhere that is un very unlikely to have its own life, an asteroid, don't worry about it. We write down what we do, but there are no constraints. So mining asteroids, not a problem for planetary protection. However, if you're going to go to a place that could host Earth life, then you want to be much more careful, Mars being a good example. The moons of Mars are not likely to host their own life, but material from Mars, particularly Mojave Crater, which is only about somewhere between one and four million years old and is 60 kilometers across, could have distributed material to the moons of Mars. So Phobos and Deimos are a bit of a question. But overall, we only take precautions when we have, uh, we take precautions when we do have data to suggest that we need to take precautions. We are careful in recognizing what we don't know as we start exploring. Uh, so in the context of Mars, the similar approach applies. Places on Mars that we are confident or have a low probability of hosting Earth life have fewer restrictions than places on Mars that look like they might have a higher possibility of hosting Earth life. But we know how to explore Mars because the Viking missions could go anywhere on Mars today. So there are a set of protocols that we executed in the 1970s. If we do the same protocols, then those spacecraft can go anywhere. There are also other approaches for reducing the amount of Earth life on spacecraft going to Mars, such that we are confident that, that Earth life won't be introduced into places that we wouldn't want it to go. This is a concern, of course, because we also learn more about Earth life. When the Viking missions were launched to Mars, those spacecraft were fully baked to kill all the organisms that we knew about at the time on the surface. Turns out that that same process would kill all the organisms we know about today. But we have discovered that there are many more Earth organisms that have capabilities we didn't expect. So if you had pizza last night, or if you put cheese on your, on your salad last night, or cheese on your pasta, you probably have organisms in your mouth right now that could grow on Mars, as long as they are protected from the UV radiation, so that, that is lethal to organisms, and they, have a few, and they have some level of water and nutrients. So there are probably organisms in your mouth right now that could grow on Mars if they had an umbrella and a cold drink. Earth life is much more uh, capable than we think it is. That's something we're still learning, so we want to take into account those considerations as we go to explore other places. And that's not just for the science. That's for everything we want to do. We don't want to bring something like malaria. We don't want to bring something that would eat the perchlorates on Mars that future human settlers might want to use, because that would then be, you know, in the future, something that we could have prevented and we didn't prevent it because we didn't pay attention, because we didn't want to spend the money. That's a really a bad reason for making such a, such a 
a mistake that has so many significant future consequences. So from the risk-benefit analysis, it's much greater benefit to the future if we take fewer risks now in terms of allowing organisms to get out that we don't realize are there. So, and this has been written into the planetary protection policy since the beginning. There's a period of biological exploration, which in the 1960s was thought to be 50 years. And after that, we would have learned everything that we might have wanted to know about life on Mars, and therefore we could choose what to do later. You know, I want my flying car. That didn't happen. The tempo of exploration is a little bit more slow than was expected in the 1950s, 1960s, but that concept still applies. We take a phased approach. We're very careful early. The Viking missions were baked. As we learned about Mars, turns out Mars looks very cold and dry if you look at the Viking data. We relax the requirements. Oh, goodness, we've now seen gullies. Turns out there's water on Mars. That means some places of Mars are mar more hospitable to Earth life than we expected. So we tailor appropriately the requirements to the things that we want to do. Humans can't really bake a human and have them be good, be good for very much afterwards. We have microbes associated with the humans. So let's understand the microbial populations associated with the human missions, send the very clean robots, sterile robots, to the places where the Earth life could survive, site the human missions, land the humans in places where any released microorganisms are less likely to survive, the, the, the zone, exploration zone approach, exactly. And then that way we can assure that we get to do, have, gain the benefits from the exploration we want to do without increasing the risk that we do something that's going to negatively affect future, future human activities at Mars. There are microorganisms which if you build them into cement, you can make, them self, they can make the cement self-healing because those organisms in the presence of water actually produce carbonate. That would be really convenient for cement it would be really inconvenient if they got into an aquifer on Mars. So understanding the consequences of what we do, you don't want your aquifer to turn into cement, the water won't flow, you don't have any more, is a very important aspect that is what planetary protection is about. And the way that we choose to do that, uh, the, the, way, the only way that we can do that is using information. So we need the science to understand what it is that makes sense, what doesn't make sense in terms of trying to preserve our options and keep them open for the future. Thanks. Thank you, Cassie. Jim? Yep. So the question is, uh, what, what is science? A scientific basis for the human exploration of Mars requires an understanding of science. And it's very, very simple. Science is simply the exploration of the unknown. And indeed, science is exploration, and exploration is science. A good example of a scientific question, for example, is just to look at the, the characteristics of our own home planet Earth. We want to know how it formed, where it's been in the past, what does it look like now, and where is it going in the future? This is a really difficult question. Geologists, geophysicists have been working on this for hundreds of years. But we do know, in fact, that it is evolving, and in fact, the only thing constant on the Earth has changed. This is critically important because it tells us that the Earth is so dynamic uh, that, in fact, the very little of the record from its first part of its history is preserved. The first half of solar system history on the Earth is just not there. I've had the opportunity in my career alone to look at, spend five seasons in Antarctica, to explore active volcanoes, Mount St. Helens in Hawaii, to dive to the bottom of the seafloor three or four times just to see what's there and explore and make sampling, et cetera. And this is exactly what we need to do for the other planetary bodies. The key question on the Earth, though, if we want to understand where we're going, we need to understand where we've been. And sadly, uh, the geological record on the Earth is vastly underrepresented for the first half of solar system history. This is a clock from the beginning of the Earth history to the present. The blue represents the percentage of the surface area that is, exists from that geological record, and you can see the uh, right-hand side, the first half of solar system history is essentially gone. So this is a difficult question. How are we going to understand where we are now if we don't, in fact, solve this scientific problem through further exploration? But it can't be done on the Earth. Well, as Andy Weir said this morning, there's a nightlight for Earth that's up in the sky here. And in fact, it's easy to get to relatively. Uh, so we've been there before. We continue to go there. And in fact, when we take a look at this, we find that the moon, just like the other terrestrial planets, provides the hidden history of the Earth. The missing history of the Earth is revealed in the geological evolution of these bodies. On the left-hand side, we see the origin of the planets up to the present. The blue is the Earth. The yellow is the moon, Mercury, and Mars. 
this is what the geological record looked like. By studying the geology, we can actually understand these missing chapters in Earth history. So what are the scientific questions we're asking about Mars? We see four and a half billion years laid out in front of your eyes here of geological evolution of Mars. Absolutely incredible. If the geological record is there that we don't even have on the Earth. So we can take a look at the youngest portion, which is the yellow, which is about the last three billion years of extremely cold and dry history. That's why I spend five seasons in Antarctica to study analogs of this. The blue area there, the Hesperian, uh, is in fact a period when there's huge amounts of volcanic activity on the surface. And in fact, the massive floods of water came out, perhaps even forming oceans in the northern lowlands. And the brown area, the Hesperian, the oldest part, has valley networks and features open basin lakes that are testimony to the evolution of a very different Mars, perhaps warm and wet, perhaps the cradle of life on another planetary body. So there's plenty to study on Mars, absolutely, and it informs us very much about the Earth. We also see an array of mineralogy, as you can see here, which is very distinctive, telling us something significant about early warm and wet Mars history. So how do we explore other planetary bodies? Well, we start with robots. This is an example of what the Soviets did in their precursor missions to send humans to the surface of the moon. Uh, lunar landers, lunar rovers, lunar sample returns, orbiters, and in fact, human-rated Zon missions in orbit and fly overs of the moon, et cetera. Uh, we sent the US 21 robotic missions before we, in fact, went on to Apollo, which was an incredible achievement. And in fact, the first lunar village, uh, you can see here, was not just a human mission, they were human robotic missions. So Apollo 15, 16, 17 had rovers, which enabled human robotic partnerships to be developed. So what about Mars? Well, we have plenty of robotic missions for Mars. As you can see from this chart, we're learning how to, in fact, do this better and better. We have assets at the surface that are roving around at the present. Uh, but in fact, uh, what about humans? How do we get humans to Mars? And what are the precedents for human, humans beyond low Earth orbit? Well, of course, the Apollo missions. I was lucky enough as Jim mentioned, to be, in fact, working in my first job out of graduate school in, in selection of landing sites. Where do we go on the moon? Traverse planning, what do we do when we get there? Astronaut training, how do you turn extremely highly motivated and bright test pilots and uh, engineers into geologists and scientists to study the surface? Uh, and in fact, in mission operations, and then in fact, in the analysis of the data when it came back. These were incredible missions. Six expedition, expeditions of scientific exploration of the moon. We know how to do this. We did it 50 years ago. And in fact, we can figure it out now to apply these lessons to Mars. Let's not forget this, because there are huge lessons to be gained here. And in fact, one of the key things is, that you can see from this chart where I placed all the Apollo missions, the Lunacod missions, and some of the Mars rover missions in the context of a single point at the middle that we ranged out to 12 to 13 to 14 kilometers, OK? So we're covering real real estate. We did this decades ago. We know how to do this. Let's pay attention to the lessons. Apollo missions were not just about the geology. There was science on the moon. There was science from the moon. We actually did astronomical observations, et cetera. There was science at the moon. And of course, we developed, working with the engineers, science and engineering synergism. So Mars, where do we go and what do we do on Mars? For science, science is exploration. Well, it's very clear. We have this very broad area to explore. Uh, about 10 to 15 years ago, we were involved in the Human Exploration of Mars Science Analysis Group, where we, in fact, did uh, uh, traverses and design reference missions. Uh, we looked at the Nowakian. We did one for each of these periods of the history of the planet. Uh, the one for the Nowakian, in fact, was to an open basin lake, 40 kilometer wide region, which has deltas, input channels, filled up with water, flowed out the other side. This is a place probably 2020 stands a good chance of going to. It's an incredible place. These are the kind of exploration expeditions that we need uh, to establish resources, understand the science, et cetera. We had one for the Hesperian, the massive outflow channels. We, in fact, uh, looked at areas in which these channels came out of the water, came out of the ground, and flowed across the surface. Absolutely amazing ability to explore these with humans uh, with a vengeance, if you will. And then finally, the cold and icy period. Volcanism was still occurring, the sides of these massive volcanoes in the equatorial region, and the glaciers that are superposed on top. Some 170,000 square kilometer deposits are there. So, that was 15 years ago. Now, as Rick explained, we're engaged in a huge exploration expedition into present time. Uh, we're actually looking at uh, this wonderful work workshop that we had. In fact, our site that we proposed is, as you can see from the red area arrow at the mid-latitudes, it is characterized by debris-covered glaciers on the right-hand upper side there. And in fact, we can see evidence just below the surface, a few tens of meters, meters or so. Uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of meters of pure ice uh, feedstock. Uh, debris you can use for roads and other kinds of things. 
uh, stripped off these to explore. It's at the latitude that you're at right now, basically right at NASA headquarters, Washington, D.C. And we've, you'll see a change here, we've engaged a huge number of people with different backgrounds, architects, scientists, engineers. We engaged Andy Weir. Andy said, well, what, do you, what could I do? I said, Andy, you're going to be in charge of contingency planning. Okay, you really thought this out, okay? <laughs> uh, we engaged, uh, in fact, uh, Mark Nelson of the Biosphere. We engaged the designer of the Biosphere. Here's something, you've designed a facility, Biosphere 2. Mark Nelson lived in it for two years. Here are people who can give us perspective. This is an exciting time, and as Rick pointed out, this is really great. We're on our way now with a great team for science and engineering synergism. So I point out that we can cover geological processes here. We can look at resources indeed in detail. And the question is, we're not just looking at the science here, but we're looking at how to establish a foothold and live on the surface. That's why all these engineering aspects are key in our choice of science uh, site selection. Well, who's going to do all this, OK? Well, it's pretty clear that the young people of today, students at Brown, for example, are working with Dave Scott, who's a visiting professor at Brown, the Apollo 15 commander. We're doing a 500-day mission back to Hadley Apennine, where Dave went, to show what you can do in 500 days on the moon. It stayed time for a couple of years. Here's Dave Scott on the lower left-hand corner on the moon. Uh, you can see him on the right on the red sweater on, in the classroom talking to the students and in the laboratory working with us to design these missions. In addition to this, we're still working with the astronauts. The astronaut corps, the 21st class, for example, the eight balls, there are eight of them, uh, four of these recently visited, visited the capsule, and I have to tell you that these people are incredible, absolutely. This, these are the people that are going to the surface of Mars, and in fact, Jessica Mayer, the one in uh, the third one from the, the second one from the left, got the highest grade in my introductory class in planetary science ever, okay? I would follow Jessica and Anne McLean, 200 combat missions in Afghanistan, et cetera. I'd follow them as a crew member on their crew to Pluto, for Christ's sake. I'm telling you, okay? These are incredible people. What is the legacy of all this? It's science. It's about science. It's what do we do when we get there? How do we take advantage of things? But it's what we learn that makes our life richer and our understanding better. So I'm excited about the science and engineering synergism and how we get to Mars with humans and really explore the planet. Thank you. So, I, I, I would just like to add one thing that um, Jim's team is really an ex a really wonderful example of the sort of interdisciplinary approach that we really see this all growing Sorry, towards. Jim. And I would even add that, you know, this stuff is so new that, you know, you, you basically sheer interest and drive is really what's needed to help drive this thing to a good solution set. You don't have to have, you know, 16 PhDs in the room. I, and I'm not trying to say that I'm, in a negative way. I'm just saying it's so new that we had a, a guy that was um, just a ninth grader who actually um, had proposed credible landing sites for the Mars 2020 um, that actually were reviewed in a workshop thing. And then he proposed a site for this uh, effort that we've kicked off, and it was incredibly credible too. So, I mean, he works like the Dickens, do not get me wrong, but there's tremendous, we need a lot of ideas, and that's the message I would can try to convey. And he defended his choices yeah, in, in front yeah, of the group. It was really exceptional. Yeah. Remarkable. Jacob. OK. <clears throat> Skipped here. OK. Um, so uh, my name is Jacob Bleacher, and I work at Goddard Space Flight Center. And um, I was hired about 10 years ago now. Um, I'm a scientist. I study volcanism, as uh, Jim introduced in the beginning. But um, I was really brought in to um, sort of bridge this gap between science and human exploration. And uh, that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, there was definitely a push when I came in uh, to try to learn as much as possible from the folks who were still around from the Apollo era. <laughs> and uh, I tried to do that as best as I could along with the uh, colleagues that were hired at the same time as me. So I show this slide here, um, looking forward a little bit towards what it might be like on Mars, but continuing to look back and make sure that we learn from what was done before. So I'm following along uh, with Jim's lessons here. And uh, you know, Jim's a, a great example. He's, he's the type of person who uh, someone like myself has followed in his footsteps and been able to learn a lot from him. For instance, I followed in his footsteps as we walked out here to sit down in these seats to uh, give the presentation today, so it just it <laughs> continues on and on. Um, but I, I, another point I wanted to make here is that um, I'm presenting uh, some of the work we do based on how we as scientists are working with <clears throat> the developing architecture, all these different groups that are here today and, and some that aren't. 
Um, but uh, I represent a, a pretty large group of folks, and uh, I work pretty closely with a group out of Stony Brook University in New York, as well as the uh, scientists down at Johnson Space Center. So um, a point that Jim has always made that I've thought to be very important is the synergy between different teams. Uh, it's not just the scientists trying to get humans to Mars to do science. There's a lot more to be dealt with. But what is it that we as scientists are trying to understand? And Jim gave a, a really good overview of what that means. This is the kind of slide that uh, I like to show. Um, if you look at the top, in the corner there, I show an active lava flow. Again, I'm a guy that studies lava flows, so everything I, I understand is generated from lava flows. Uh, but you, we look up there and we can, on Earth, we can go to places um, where we can see active volcanic process. That's really what we want to try to understand. What processes are active now? What processes were active in the past? How have they changed through time? How are they distributed globally? Um, if you go to other places on the Earth where volcanoes aren't currently active, you can look at older deposits and you can use different approaches to try and infer what happened. So that first arrow between process and morphology or the shape of the terrain um, also points the other direction. You understand the morphology in an effort to understand process. You can do this from orbit as well. You can start to link ground truth with orbital perspectives and see a much broader context of a planet. Um, now, I made this slide a long time ago. So at the bottom, the arrow points over to Mars. And I used to um, talk about the tools that we had, remote sensing, mapping, modeling. We've had rovers on the surface. But now the question is, you know, we might have humans doing the field work. So we can pretty much start from anywhere in this cycle and try to drive back towards process. So as a scientist, that's what we're really trying to get at. So what do we do? What do we contribute other than once you get scientists there, they do their thing and we leave them alone? We don't want it to be that way. We want to be part of the plan. We want to help advise on how to create everything that supports what we want to do. So the types of work that I do are summarized here in this um, slide. Everything is underpinned at the top there by basic science. So we go out in the field here on Earth and we try to understand fundamental science about the Earth, as Jim pointed out, putting the pieces together for this dynamic planet that we live on. And in some ways, we study the processes here on Earth in an effort to understand the processes on other planets called comparative planetary geology or planetology. While we're doing that, as you move down to the middle set of pictures, we're looking at new technologies, different types of instruments, the different types of tools that we might use. Here on Earth, we, you know, we constantly push that envelope. How can I use this new tool? But again, if you're straddling the groups between human spaceflight and science, you start thinking about how can these tools be of use when we go to another planet? Or more importantly, how could they be a hindrance? And we want to avoid that at all costs. We want to make good and effective tools that can be used in a um, very productive manner when we get there. Because one thing we know for sure is if you make a tool that doesn't fit into the system, the person that's using it probably won't because it's just a pain. Now, as we do all this, at the bottom, we kind of drive towards what this integration, this synergy is all about. As we learn all these lessons underpinned by the science, learning new technologies, we start driving towards recommendations for future missions. So that's a summary of the type of job that, um, that we do. This is just an example of one of the field sites that we work at. We work in the southwest rift zone of Kilauea Volcano. In fact, I came home just to give this talk. My team is still out there right now working. Um, but this is the kind of um, place that we go to. There are volcanoes on Mars. There are lava flows on Mars. Very similar lava flows on Earth. There are things we can learn about them here that provide insight to the other planets. So field operations, when we go out in the field, we have basic science objectives that we want to try to understand. How are these lava flows in place? But as we also think about the human side of it, of exploration, we start to develop other um, operations. So maybe assessing what we're doing as we're doing it, trying to understand the operations and timelines involved in getting the job done. On Earth, um, you know, Jim has mentioned going to places like Antarctica. That's fairly remote. You can't just go back there next week if you forgot to do something. That's a really good analog for a place like the Moon or Mars where you just can't go back next week because you didn't do it right. But there are places we can go back next week, and we can be fairly exploratory about the operations and the procedures. If it didn't work, well, then let's figure out why it didn't work and let's go back and test it again. 
So the point here is that there are a lot of different types of objectives, some that are science and some that are related to exploration. Um, another point I want to make here, um, it's, I've heard this several times brought up, the, the engagement of the public along this journey. Uh, one of the last field teams that I was working with from Stony Brook, we tapped into and took advantage of their school of journalism. And we actually brought along six students who are learning science communication and science journalism. We brought them in the field with us. And um, right. as scientists, you know you can, it's sometimes tough. You don't want to be misquoted. You don't want your work to be misportrayed. But at the same time, we can't have firewalls between us and the journalists, who <coughs> are in many ways the ones who actually do communicate with the public for us. So another part about this, these field tests and field work, is learning how to bring the public along with us on this journey to Mars. And that's a very, very important aspect. So I'll just give a couple quick, quick examples here. Uh, we go out in the field and we test different instruments. One of the things we've been testing is what happens if you get a low altitude perspective of yourself while you're working. Uh, we work in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Um, for those of you who go into national parks, uh, you know there are usually signs that say no drones, no UAVs. So we've gotten around that by using tethered kites. They don't have as much of a problem with those. But the platform doesn't really matter. It's the approach and the operations related to it. If you can get into the air, you get a very interesting perspective of what you're doing on the surface, a contextual view that you don't necessarily have when you're on the ground. And you can produce different data sets. This is an example of one of the products we put together for a field site. In this case, we had members go out and lay down what we call tie points or markers. We used uh, GPS to tie those into uh, a global mosaic. And we were able to project this onto Google Earth. And so there, we can actually put down the tracks that our, our team made. We can show where the sample locations were. And we can really pull these together. And some of this can come together pretty quickly if you can get that perspective. So again, the key is here not to say that this is exactly what we need when we go to Mars. It's evaluating whether or not this is a worthwhile approach to doing it. That's what we have the time to do right now as we're, we're working towards Mars. Another thing that we're looking at is contact instruments. There are instruments now that you can put against a surface or near a surface that provide information in basically real time. Um, so we're trying to evaluate, do we want those kind of tools? Uh, some of the folks I work with, we've polled the science community on what, what do you think an astronaut would need if they were out on an EVA? And that laundry list is huge. Everybody thinks the, t the instrument they make is the instrument that an astronaut needs on their belt. We get to a point in what we call the bat belt, where there just happens to be every instrument. But in reality, that doesn't work very well. You have limited space. You have to carry all of this. So again, we're getting at the question here about what is the useful way to use these types of instruments before we're starting to ask the question about which one is the right one to use. Do we even want this kind of instrumentation out there? It turns out there are a lot of different ways that they can provide additional information. You just have to understand how that fits within the operations. So as you're collecting all of this data, another issue that comes up is the data accessibility. The crew members at Mars are not going to be able to speak in real time to support teams back on Earth. They've got at least a 20-minute one-way comm delay to deal with, best of conditions. So they can't call back to someone like Jim or myself and say, do we really need to pick this rock up, or is that the right water sample we want to grab? So they're going to have to depend on the information they're collecting. Part of that is training, but another part of that is what information do they actually need to make the decisions in real time? Underpinning that is how do they get that information in a spacesuit? So we look at different approaches to wearable computers, keep a <coughs> crew member in the rover or the habitat who's processing information for them while they're working. Essentially, you bring your back room and you keep it in the habitat. So again, the question's about how do we do this? Um, this picture of these rovers have been sprinkled through some of these talks. Uh, we call this a space exploration vehicle. Uh, this is a concept that um, we learned a lot of lessons from Apollo. Uh, the current concept is having a pressurized rover. And within that rover, if you look on the aft deck or the back deck of that rover, you can see the spacesuits hanging outside. This is, I believe, the type of vehicle that Rick was envisioning for the landing site workshop. In this case, you stay inside your rover, and you can wear basically shirt sleeves. But when you need to go out on an EVA, you hop into the suit. So you're not in the suit eight, nine hours all day, every day. You're just in the suit when you need to be. If you look at the bottom there, my colleague Brent is in the process of going through what we call a suit port hatch into the suit. 
So there's a few diagrams there. Uh, the first picture of him, he's basically sitting on his bed and he's opening the hatch, at which point he can then shove his legs out into the legs of the suit. That hatch will close behind him and then he can uh, egress the vehicle and go about his business. This is a view of what that looks like on the outside. The, uh, the operator or the astronaut hops into the suit from the inside and detaches and off they go. They can go out on an EVA, they can roam around the vehicle. So the vehicle does the bulk of the, of the, tra the traveling, carrying all of the heavy gear. The astronaut can get out and do a short range EVA around the vehicle. Uh, we've tested suits. We're working on um, you know, how do we make sure that the suits can provide the ability we need to do the science that we'd like to do. Uh, so this is just a survey of um, the suits that we've used in recent years, but the important point here is that all of determining which suit or how you're looking at this is based on the questions you're trying to answer. So on the uh, far right there, if you're not specifically <laughs> evaluating a suit during the test, then you don't need to wear a full suit. Um, you don't need to beat yourself up if that's not the question you're trying to answer. So again, it all goes back to the questions about how do we use things? What are the right operations and procedures? And we've done this all the way up to working in micro or no gravity environments. So there are test capabilities at Johnson Space Center. And again, we work with the scientists down there. Uh, we talked uh, in the last session a little bit about EVA capabilities along the way. Uh, so we can look at these kind of things. Maybe there are, as Jim asked from the crowd, situations where we need to go EVA. Some of those might be uh, for fixing things, but um, as we're in transit, there may be additional science that we come up with that could be done. There could be things such as monitoring the solar wind, making deep space observations. You know, it's a long transit time to get to Mars, and there could be things that we want to do, and some of those things might require getting out of the vehicle. So again, how can scientists provide input to the engineers who are working on this equipment to make sure the equipment can work the best it can for us? Another aspect to this, and again, this is where we've um, learned a lot from Jim, um, is basically training. We work on training the astronauts. Uh, Jim showed a few pictures of folks from the last class. We worked with training them. Uh, it involved some classroom activities. It also involved field activities. Uh, we also bring them out on an individual basis in what we call field assistance. They come out into the field with the trainers that we have. <clears throat> they, they get to go out and learn what science is like. We, we like to refer to that as learning to talk the talk. Okay? It's not a matter of you went over to the dot and you pushed a button, now the science is done. It's a matter <laughs> of doing the science, having the conversations, mm -hmm. testing the hypotheses. Mm -hmm. um, there's also an aspect to this involving the, uh, the, the analog tests, which I showed you with the um, suits and things like that. So we take advantage of any opportunity to insert some of this training. And I'll also point out that this isn't just the astronauts. We also train uh, managers and engineers from across NASA. So we want to make sure that they come out with us and they learn what it is that we're going to be asking them to do as they're building the hardware. Uh, so real quick here. Um, you know, from a science perspective, we're sending missions to Mars already. We've been doing it for a long time. Um, but we also have this opportunity to try and integrate, or as the word Jim uses, synergy with the engineers as this comes along. Determine the technologies that are needed. Start developing those technologies and learn how they integrate together with the, the overall architecture. This gets to the point of evaluating the procedures for this technology. Another important point is making sure that the stakeholders themselves are prepared for this fusion. Okay? We don't want people showing up with this widget and we're not quite sure how it fits into things, but they had money to build it, so they did. We've got to get everybody together the whole way along the process. So the value of this, I think we've all talked about it. There's just one more point I want to make and reiterate is um, we, in this process, we're learning how to engage the public and bring them along. So we see things such as Andy's book and movie that really energize the public. With uh, Desert Rats, one of the analog tests, we had the public polled and they helped us select EVA stations. Uh, it might seem like this is just a process of you know, doing neat things and, and trying to show the cool things we're doing, but we're learning the process of engaging the public along the, along the way. It's part of the test just like any of the other science objectives. Uh, so that's all I have to say, Jim. Um, I'm, I guess we're done. All right, thank you, Jacob. I think I noticed the, uh, the time sign coming up here, so I just want to summarize real quick. 
we heard from Rick about uh, it's important to start thinking about where we go and take into consideration those things that may be valuable in the long run to us. We heard from Jim the wide palette of science that's available uh, to be worked in and uh, discovered when we are there. We heard from Jacob a little bit about the tools of the trade and how we may approach doing the job. And we heard from Cassie about some of the precautions as we get into the life science aspects of Mars exploration. So contemplate some of those, and when we get back from lunch, uh, we'll take your questions.